John 16. You say, I thought you were in the 17th chapter. I am. And we'll read the first five verses of, the, of that chapter in a moment. But um, I want to read a passage in the 16th chapter before we do that. I'm assuming now that all of you are acquainted with the context of John 13 through 17. These constitute, these chapters constitute the greatest portion of Scripture that you'll find in God's Word. Due to the fact these are the last words of our Savior before He went to Calvary. And these are words not spoken to the world in general. These words were spoken by him to his disciples. Now, I'm not going to start reading with the first verse. I want to drop down to verse 16. And we'll read. And I think, I think I'm going to read out of the, I got the King James here, but I think I'm going to read out of the NASB. We may take time and we may not this morning translate some of the Greek texts uh, in within the passage that we will be studying today. But let's begin in the 16th chapter with verse 16. Now, you can't help but notice this, and you ought to underscore it. In other words, our Lord was foretelling his resurrection, uh, his death and resurrection to his disciples. And they didn't understand it very well. You say, well, why didn't they? Put yourself in their shoes. You wouldn't have un understood it had you been there any more than they did. A little while. That's a great statement, so keep it in mind. It's found a number of times in our passage that we're reading a little while and you will no longer behold me and again a little while and you will see me what's he talking about some of his disciples therefore said to one another what is this thing he is telling us? A little while, and you will not behold me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. Now, notice the word Father. The next reference is Holy Father. And the third reference is Righteous Father. In chapter 17. Now. <clears throat> Jesus knew that they wished to question him. And he said to them. Are you deliberating together about this? That I said a little while. And you will not behold me. And again a little while. And you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. I'm stopping for a reason. I'm pausing for a good reason. Let that soak in. Let's look at it again. Truly, truly. I say to you, the disciples, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Whenever a woman, now he's going to give an illustration. Whenever a woman is in travail 
she has sorrow. When the birth pains come, she's in sorrow. Because her hour has come. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Whenever a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she remembers the anguish no more. For joy that a child has been born into the world. Can you mothers relate with that? Can you fathers relate with that? Having experienced what your wife has gone through in giving birth to a child? Now notice verse 22. Therefore you... Two now have sorrow. That is the disciples. And your heart will rejoice. And no one takes your joy away from you. Why did you read that portion before you began a verse by verse discussion? And we'll begin with verse 1 of chapter 17. So let's look now at the first verses of chapter 17. These things Jesus spoke. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, notice now the three times and I want you to remember this because this is a tremendous outline for a message. He first referred to God, the first person of the Godhead, as Father. The second time as Holy Father. And the final time as Righteous Father in this chapter. So keep that in mind. That's a tremendous lesson within itself. Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Even as thou gavest him authority, and the word here in the Greek is not the word for power. I think in the King James, I believe it's power, isn't it? In the King James, that's not a good translation, folks. It is not dunamis, which is the Greek word for power, but it is exousia, the word for authority. And in this instance, authority should be recognized. So even as thou gavest him authority over all mankind, Folks, it says over all mankind. It means exactly what it says. There is no one who has ever lived, is living, or shall ever live, who has not been, or is, or shall be under the authority of God. You may talk about your freedom. You may curse God. You may use his name in vain. And all of those things, but you're under his authority. Like it or not, you are. And you're going to stand before him someday. Sinner or saint. If you're a sinner, if you're a reprobated person, you'll still be judged according to the way you live while you are here on earth. 
even the reprobates, some will receive much greater punishment than others. So he says authority. He has power too. No one can do anything unless God grant him the ability to do it. That's John 19, 11, not very far from where we're reading now. So thou gavest him authority over all mankind that to all whom thou hast given him. There's the first reference of seven references to those the Father gave to the Son. Do you have them all marked in your Bible? Did you know I can look at your Bible and tell you just about how much time you give to studying? I can look at anybody's Bible and know just about what he knows. Have a good understanding of just about what he or she knows. Person who really studies, he can't help but mark his Bible. You're going to mark it. You're going to make notes. You can't help but do it because you want to go back. You want to be able to recall those things, to retrieve them, as it were, as quickly as you can sometimes. So then he goes on to say, And to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou sent. Verse 4, I glorified thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou hast given me to do. See, his hour had come. The hour of Calvary had arrived. It is now time for him to die. All of his life had been in preparation for his death, his sacrificial death, his atoning death, his redeeming death. I've glorified thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou has given me to do, and now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the beginning of time. Now that's as far as we're reading this morning. But in order to understand that, and before I begin with verse 1, we're going to look at verse 16 forward, the passage that I've read from the 16th chapter. <clears throat> chapter 16 is most important if we are to understand our place in this world. The Savior has laid the foundation for our place in his own work. Our place is Christ's place on the earth. As Christ was in the world, but not of the world, you and I now are in the world, but we're not of the world. The world hates you. Because at first hated Christ. That's biblical, folks. That's found in the 15th chapter. And we'll see references made to that statement again. As we go forward in our study of John 17. As Jesus Christ was alone and yet not alone. Verse 32 so are we to have a similar experience in this world. And you want to know the passage that describes that similar experience? 
I'll give it to you. It's 2 Timothy 4, verses 10 through 18. Paul talks about himself in that portion of Scripture. But it's also applicable to you and me. So Jesus Christ is hidden for a little while, verses 16 through 19. That's what I want to look at before we get in, really, to the first five verses, which is the first division of chapter 17. <clears throat> the Savior was going to the Father. The disciples did not understand this. You and I would not have had we been there. The Lord develops the fact and its consequences without showing them the whole import of what he said. He presented the subject on the human and historical side. And that we have to have in order to understand it. There are two little quals that I want us to look at for a moment. Two little quals. The period between the death and the resurrection of Christ is the first. That's what our Lord was telling the disciples. The disciples were sad when Christ left them by way of the cross. But he spent 40 days with them subsequent to the resurrection. 40 days personally with them, walking with them, talking with them in his glorified body until his ascension 40 days subsequent to his resurrection. Therefore, the disciples were sad when Christ left them by way of the cross, but they were glad when he left them by way of the cloud. Luke 24, verse 52. They could rejoice at that time. And you have a record of it in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning with verse 9 through verse 11, if you want to read that sometime. So they had learned that Christ abides with his own in the person of the Holy Spirit even during his absence. It is biblical for you to say that Christ dwells in your heart. That's scriptural. How does he dwell in your heart? Not in the person of the second person of the Godhead, but in the person of the Holy Spirit. But there are many people today who call themselves religious people, but they're heathen. They deny the divine triunity. And I'll get into something before we leave this this morning. I want to ask you some questions and how you would answer some questions if they were asked you. Concerning the prayer of Christ. Now what do we have in this chapter? Chapter 17. We have the prayer of Jesus Christ. Let me raise a question at this point. Can God pray to God? Suppose those who deny the divine triunity today ask you a question and uh, I'm going to put the question to you as it has been put to Trinitarians and uh, an ignorant Trinitarian gave the wrong answer when he was asked the question do you mean there are ignorant Trinitarians Plenty of them. I was ignorant when I was first saved. I had to study the subject of the divine triunity in order to understand it and explain it. How three could be one and one could be three. 
You say, That's, that doesn't make sense. Spirituality doesn't make sense to an unregenerate mind. But it does to a regenerate mind. And an ignorant Trinitarian gave a person who did not believe in the divine trinity the wrong answer to the question. And the question was, can God pray to God? That was the question the person who denies the trinity asked. The person who believed in the trinity said... The second person of the Godhead prayed to the first person of the Godhead. End of quote. Was he right? Is that correct? Is that the way you would answer? If it is, you're wrong. God absolutely considered cannot pray to God absolutely considered. God cannot pray to God. I want to ask you another question this morning. I'll answer that in a few minutes. But I want to show you why we have to be students of the Scriptures. And every regenerated person has a desire to know the mind of God. I'm going to hasten to say that. And that eliminates most church members today. I said it eliminates them. Jesus Christ could pray only as the God-man. It is because of the incarnation that Jesus Christ could pray to the Father. And he's praying to the Father. In the 17th chapter of the act uh, of uh, the Gospel of John, but he's not praying as God absolutely considered. He's praying as the mediator that stands between God the Father and the sinner that He is about to redeem when He goes to Calvary. And pays the price of his redemption. Now my second question to you this morning. I want to see how much you've learned. And how much you've kept in mind. Through the years that you have been a Christian. Is Jesus Christ continuing this prayer. In John 17. At the right hand of God the Father. Is he continuing. He isn't praying to the Father. He's there as our mediator. But he's not praying in that capacity. He is our mediator. He's the only mediator between God and man. So Jesus Christ is not in heaven praying for you and me. But the prayer he prayed before his death in the capacity of the mediator. Standing between you and me and God. Standing between us and God. He did pray. And that prayer is applicable. For all time. For all time. So the oneness wisely asked the question. That is the person who denied the divine trinity. The divine triunity. Was the second person God? In other words, when the person who said he was a Trinitarian said the second person prayed to the first person of the Godhead, he then asked him, was the second person God? And the Trinitarian said, ignorant Trinitarian said, yes. Then he said, wait a minute. God can't pray to God. He was right. 
the Trinitarian got himself in a mess by not knowing how to explain it. Now let's take this a little further. The oneness are those who do not believe in the divine trinity, believe that the human nature prayed to the divine nature. Are you with me? Thus, they have two persons in Christ. And that's heresy. That's heresy. The human nature of Christ is only a thing, T-H-I-N-G, Luke 1, 3, 5. That holy thing, referring to the human nature of Jesus Christ. So the human nature of Christ is only a thing until it is united to the person of the eternal Son. Now, folks, I'm not picky. I'm not trying to put up a smoke screen or cause confusion. I am responsible under God to handle the truth of Scripture correctly. So oneness believe the Son is the flesh. They teach, quote, a divine person does not need help, only men need help, end of quote. So if the Son of God was no more than human nature, then a man is without a mediator. That means a oneness don't have a mediator, folks. That means the orthodox Jew who denies Jesus Christ does not have a mediator, folks. Now this brings about a lot of questions. And it takes a lot of time to study. And to unravel these things. But they're just as clear as they can be to the spiritual mind. And he has no problem understanding them. It is true that deity cannot pray. To whom would he pray? If God the Father prayed, to whom would he pray? He cannot speak to one higher than himself. You see what I'm talking about? But he who was deity assumed a human nature... And thus became the God-man who is capable of praying only as the God-man. So Jesus Christ can touch God the Father and touch all of those the Father gave him in the covenant of redemption because of the hypostatic union. And the greatest Christological passage on the hypostatic union in the scriptures is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So it's in the capacity of the God-man that Jesus Christ prayed. It was only in Christ's state of humiliation that he prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane he prayed. And here speaking to his disciples, he prayed. So, his intercession in heaven is never expressed in God's word as prayer. Does that surprise you? So let's look at this now. So the person between his death and resurrection went back to the Father. So the disciples were sad when Christ left them by way of the cross. 
But he spent 40 days with them subsequent to his resurrection. Therefore, the disciples were sad. When Christ left them by way of the cross, they were sad. But they were glad when he left them by way of the cloud. He was caught up into a cloud. Ascended up where he was before. Luke 24, 52. Now there is another little while. I want you and me. I want us to think about it. I want this to apply to me and to you. The second little while takes in the whole period between Christ's ascension and his return in glory. Let me give you a passage of scripture for it. Hebrews 10 verse 37. 10 37. Ten days after Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit came in his abiding presence. Hence the disciples and all believers since the disciples, that includes us who are here this morning as believers, were able to see Christ in a more intimate and spiritual sense than ever before. And you'll find that, folks, in the first part of the 16th chapter. In fact, up to the verse that we started reading in the 16th chapter this morning. So Christ had already assured the disciples of this fact back in chapter 14 and verse 19. The death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus were the foundation truths for which spiritual vision of Christ must be understood. And then thinking about Hebrews 10, 37, here's what we find by the writer of Hebrews. For yet a little while. You know, folks, it's just been 2,000 years. And what are 2,000 years in the light of eternity? When I think about my age, how long I've been around, a short period of time. 2,000 years. Yet a little while, the writer of Hebrews said, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So during this time, there's weeping, mourning, trouble, persecution, tribulation, suffering, Dying and on and on we could go. But in the morning, the time is coming when these things shall no longer exist. Be a time of eternal gladness, eternal joy. So we have seen thus far in verses 16 through 19 of chapter 16. That Jesus Christ is hidden a little while. You and I have never seen him. And yet we see him. Have never seen him and yet we have seen him. You say that's a contradiction. No it isn't according to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8. I've never seen him in person. But by the Holy Spirit I see him by faith. That God-given faith. Now that, so we've seen the second. You and I stand between the two advents of Christ. Just as he came the first time, folks, he's coming the second time. Hadn't been long ago, just a few days ago, a man made the statement, well, I've heard that all my life. He's coming soon. And I had to give a warning. Be careful what you say. Or you be a scoffer. According to the third chapter of 2 Peter, beginning with verse 1 through verse 6. 
only scoffers say, Oh, I've heard it all my life that Jesus Christ is coming soon. I'm sure that a lot of them have in mind these crackpots, these false prophets and teachers who set a date and they go out and look for him and then the date passes and he hasn't come. I don't set a date. I don't know the day. You don't know the day. But he's coming and it's going to be soon. For the reason being that one day with the Lord is a thou as a thousand years to you and me. So that's what the writer of Hebrews meant when he said, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now, secondly, I'd like to discuss something else. In the light of these verses 16 through 19. The disciples shall not see and yet they shall see. Shall not see and shall see. Both statements are found. Three times the words not see me. Are found in the context of what we read this morning. And again see me. Not see me and see me are used in verses 16, 17, and 19. The Lord Jesus reminded the disciples of what the cross would cost them. But in the utter self-denial, he left out what it was going to cost him. He showed them what it would cost them but he left out what it was going to cost him. Have you observed that? So what a lesson in self-abnegation for us. I said, what a lesson. Let's look at some things. Sorrow would overcome the disciples because the world will rejoice that Jesus Christ has gone. He's no longer here. What do you think the world thought about after he was crucified and he was buried? The world thought, we're rid of him. We don't have to put up with him anymore. We can now have it to ourselves. So how can believers have fellowship with a world that rejoices in the absence of Christ. I'm asking you that question this morning. The world that rejoices in the absence of Christ, how can you have fellowship with those who rejoice in the absence of Christ? Did you know that a lot of churches in quotation marks, do not have Christ in their midst. You say, who are you to say that? Folks, who am I? You know who I am. A sinner saved by grace. You want the passage? I can give it to you. The third chapter of Revelation, the letter to the church at Laodicea. Where was Christ? Not in the assembly. He was outside. Outside, what had driven him outside? Their program, their love for the things of the world had driven him outside. Is that being done today? It surely is. It surely is. So what is wrong with the world? Well, let's see what is wrong. A world rejoicing that Christ is no longer here. What is wrong with the world? I'll give you seven things. Would you like to copy them down? <clears throat> First, I want to give you two passages of Scripture to head up these seven things that I'm going to give. 
The first one is James 4.4. 4. And the second one is 1 John 2.15-17. through 17. Now you're familiar with James, uh, 1 John 2.15-17. through 17. You might not be as familiar with James 4.4. 4. So take them both together. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for the love of the Father, and so forth and so on. Pride of life of the flesh, and so forth. Now, what's wrong? First of all, there's something wrong with its sight. S-I-G-H-T. There is selfishness within. And there is materialism without. Every unregenerate person, folks, is self-possessed. All he thinks about or all she thinks about is number one. Now, whether you believe it or not, that's a fact. Selfish, self-centered. That's number one. And materialism without. You want all that you can get as an unregenerate person. The regenerate person wants a living. He's going to do his best to earn a living. He has a responsibility to his family to earn a living. Because if a person does not provide for his own, he is worse than an infidel. And that happens to be 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, I think, if my memory is serving me correctly this morning. Secondly, its slogan is wrong. Its slogan. Well, what about it? It is human attainment and not divine atonement. It's what you do. It's what you accomplish. Now, how many of you saw in the news the tribute that was given to Frank Sinatra yesterday? Come on. How many of you read the paper or saw it in the paper? I'm not going to repeat the things that they majored on. Except to just barely touch them. Wine, women, and song. Boy, that's great, isn't it? That's a real achievement, isn't it? I wonder what Frank Sinatra's thinking about today. I'm not going to preach him in heaven. I'm not going to be like these false teachers and preachers. A person who is, has gone to heaven is going to manifest what he is on earth. And he manifested what he was. So it's slogan. What is it? Human attainment. Not divine atonement. Number three, it's schooling. Schooling. It is the greatness of man and not the majesty of God. What are colleges and institutions of higher learning teaching today? What you're able to attain. So, it's what man is able to do, what he's able to attain, and not the majesty of God. The next one, its spirit is wrong. It is anti-God. And folks, we have seen what anti-God has done in England. Six percent or less of the people, the population of England, even attend the church of any kind. And look what's happening right here in America. Anti-God. So the spirit is anti-God. Next, its service is to save the surface and you save all. Just save the surface. And you save all. That's the important thing. 
And next, its head. Who's the head of this world? Satan. And finally, its supporters. Who are the supporters of this world? The unregenerate. The reprobates. Those that God passed by. Now, there are two different Greek words for not seeing and seeing. And I want you to look them up. The one used for not seeing is an important word in the Greek. But I'm going to let you look it up between now and next Sunday. And give you something to do. Look in your Greek text. You can make it out. And then go to your concordance. Two different words. One for not seeing. For seeing. Not the same word. With just a negative. For instance, not seeing. What does it mean? Well, I think I'll wait and let you all look that up. But there is a difference. So I'd like for you to find out. Maybe I need to say, well, not see me means to not contemplate me. And to see me means to seek careful, carefully, to seek carefully who I am. And who's going to carefully seek? The regenerated person. And only him. So he has been manifested to the eye. So Christ has been manifested to the ear. That's the historical record. Jesus Christ is revealed to the heart by the Holy Spirit of regeneration. And this goes beyond the eye and the ear. Reaches the heart. So the disciples were desirous to ask Christ the meaning of his soon return to their sight in verse 19 of chapter 16. The word ask, A-S-K, means asking of an equal. Watch this. So it is the word our Lord used when addressing the Father. It is used by the disciples, of the disciples, when they ask anything of the Lord. So as men from the man, the God-man, Christ Jesus. So when Christ spoke about the disciples addressing the Father, he used another word. The word which meant the asking of an inferior from a superior. Thus Christ said, in that day, you shall ask me nothing. That's verse 23. Why not ask Christ? That's a good question. As the bride, we are, so to speak, on a plane of equality. In Christ, we've been redeemed. We're part of his bride that he has purchased with his own blood. With his own blood. So in the day of grace, we are the father's children. And therefore, under the father's government. We are in the place of subjection. But we do have the privilege of direct access, Romans 8, 26 and 27, to the Father through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So the disciples had asked many questions in the ignorance of their imperf imperfectly trained minds. And folks, our minds too are imperfectly trained. So Christ pointed them to the day, the day of the divine comforter, when they would ask no more questions. You know, the time's coming. We won't have to ask any questions. We'll see him as he is. 
And I want to close this morning with a, with a simple illustration. The hope of the disciples was, I will see you again, verse 22 of chapter 16. So the sorrow of the disciples over the death and absence of Christ was of short duration. Their sorrow gave place to joy at Christ's resurrection and ascension. So the permanence of their joy was made possible by the coming of the Holy Spirit in His abiding presence. And we experience that as the recipients of grace today. Then He said to the disciples, I will see you again. I will see you again. After Christ saw the disciples again, their hearts rejoiced between his resurrection and his ascension. And that joy no man was able to take from them. As the Lord Jesus promised the disciples, so he says to us, I will see you again. He's going to see you and me again. So as the disciples were not free from sorrow after the spirit of joy filled their hearts, so believing today and not exempt, we're not exempt just because we believe. We're not exempt from sorrow, from disappointment. But as the apostles fought a good warfare and endured reproaches, as all believers now who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the divine joy in all saints will continually increase until we have all entered the heavenly kingdom. Believers are like women in travail. You and I are like women in travail. As the mere thought of the baby dispels the worry of pain, so the thought of the finality of our redemption, which is the redemption of the body, are you with me? Drives away the worry of present suffering and pain. Let's stand.